This is Revelation chapter 9, part 3. As we continue to break down the details of this prophecy, let's now look at these locusts. In Revelation 9, verse 2, it says that out of the smoke from the pit came forth locusts upon the earth. In verse 7, it says that the shapes of these locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. What is this bringing before us now? The Preterists take this to be a kind of poetic drapery used to describe the unleashing of demonic forces in relation to the destruction of Jerusalem and the Temple in AD 70. And then on the other side we have the Futurists who have to speculate on what these things relate to as they pride themselves on taking the language of this prophecy literally. But are we really supposed to be looking for some kind of hybrid creature that is part insect and part human? as we see here from this sketch taken from the Horae Apocalypticae. Are these uh, creatures like this going to come forth upon the earth because of genetic engineering? 2 Peter 1 verse 19 tells us that we have a more sure word of prophecy. And if we let the Bible interpret itself, then all the guesswork is removed. As the psalmist said in Psalm 26 verse 12, my foot standeth in an even place and this is what we want so let's stand on the word of god and find the answer to unlock the meaning of this when we look at the usage of locusts in the bible what we find is most illuminating firstly in the book of exodus we note that one of the ten plagues that god brought upon the egyptians was a plague of locusts and we read in exodus 10 verse 13 and the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. Here we see that it was an east wind that brought the locusts upon Egypt. And of course, the east wind in relation to Egypt is that which comes out of Arabia. In the prophecy, we are dealing with the rise of Islam, which is in the east and comes out of Arabia. Next we read in Judges 7 verse 12, And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay along the valley like grasshoppers for multitude. This word grasshoppers here means locusts. So in this verse we are told that this great eastern host that had come forth was like locusts for multitude. In Revelation 9 we are talking about another great host of locusts coming forth upon the earth and it comes from the east. In addition, the Arabian people are commonly understood as being Ishmaelites, that is, descended from Ishmael, and are thus related to the Midianites mentioned in this verse, who share the same ancestry. So all of the details connect to lead us to understand that these locusts being used in the prophecy are pointing us to the east, to a people coming up from the east as a great multitude upon the earth of prophecy, and these people are the Saracens. As a point in passing, it is believed by some that the name Saracen was derived from a claim by the Ishmaelites to have come through Abraham's free wife Sarah and not his bond wife Hagar, hence the term Saracens meaning Sarah's sons. Whether or not that is true I don't know and the prophecy is certainly not changed because of it one way or the other. But if it is true, then this would be a counterfeit, a substitute for the real thing, a substitute for one of the real names by which the sons of Abraham and Sarah would be called. Interestingly, one of the prophecies concerning the descendants of Abraham and Sarah has to do with their name, and that is found in Genesis 21 verse 12 where it says, And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad, and because of thy bondwoman. In all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. The prophecy says, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now, we know that these people became known as the children of Israel and as Israelites. And in the process of time, that nation was actually divorced by God as recorded in Hosea chapter 1 and fulfilled in the Assyrian captivities which are recorded in the book of 2 Kings. These same people lost the name of Israel and became known as the Gentiles. And in the process of time, one of the names they became known as was Saxons, being Isaac's sons. 
And these people are, of course, the Anglo-Saxon people of the earth. And if you haven't heard this before, please ensure that you view my series called The Two Houses of Israel, as I'm sure this will be a blessing to you. Now, getting back to these locusts, even the Muslim people themselves associate locusts with their prophet Muhammad. In the Hore Apocalyptica, Eliot writes, Muslim tradition speaks of locusts having dropped into the hands of Muhammad, bearing on their wings this inscription, quote, We are the army of the great God, end quote. Well, this is what we are being presented with in Revelation chapter 9. The shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. This is the army of the great God that is being referred to in this quotation. Eliot also points out this remarkable fact that even the very word locust itself, when sounded in the Hebrew tongue, is suggestive of the word Arab. The Hebrew word sounding for locust is Arbeh, and also when the Hebrew word for Arab is sounded, it is Arbi. So when either the word locust or Arab is sounded in the Hebrew tongue, one might be excused for confusing one with the other. Now, Edward Gibbon says, quote, The inhabitants of Syria have remarked that locusts come constantly from the desert of Arabia, end quote. So, it is obviously a commonly known fact that in relation to the Roman Empire, that locusts came from the east, that is, they came from the desert of Arabia. In this book called Travels Through Arabia and Other Countries in the East, written in 1792, we read this about the locusts. The swarms of these insects darken the air and appear at a distance like clouds of smoke. The noise they make in flying is frightful and stunning like that of a waterfall. So even the actual appearance of a plague of locusts evokes the very language used in this prophecy, smoke, the darkening of the air and a great noise which can be heard. Here the writer is only talking about literal locusts, of course, but the prophecy is dealing with something much grander, the rise of the Saracens in the east as a great host of locusts, a great army of horsemen covering the earth. And I will add that as I am recording this, I am being plagued by a small host of magpies just outside of my window, which are joining in on this recording, and that explains the bird sounds that are popping up throughout this whole series. In this book by William Samuel Cardell, written in 1815, the writer likens the Arabian followers of Muhammad to locusts overspreading the land. And we read, In the 7th century, an extraordinary individual founding a religious system on the love of show and the sensual appetites of men had given an impulse which was overspreading the fairest portion of the earth. His Arabian followers invaded the fertile plains of the Nile. The Mohammedan banners were everywhere displayed on the ancient walls of Egypt, and the Saracens, like the locusts of a former age, overspread the land. And once again, this shows how appropriate it is that the prophecy uses the language of locusts, the imagery of locusts, to describe this great Islamic woe coming forth upon the earth. Now, it's important to note that the fact that a particular historian uses the same imagery found in the prophecy does not in and of itself prove that the interpretation is correct. So please don't misunderstand this. Other peoples and armies may sometimes be described in the same way. However, the fact that historians do use the same symbols clearly shows the wisdom of God as seen in prophecy when portraying nations and events by use of those very same symbols. Furthermore, it also shows that it is reasonable and justifiable to interpret their symbolic meaning as historicists do. We are not trying to force an interpretation onto historical events. The fact is that prophecy and history are directly connected because as it has been said before, prophecy is history foretold and history is prophecy fulfilled. History is prophecy in the making and prophecy reflects history 
as it's being fulfilled. Amen. From another historian, Sir William Muir, in his book The Caliphate, written in 1891, writing about these Arabians or Saracens, he says this, Onward and still onward, like swarms from the hive, or flights of locusts darkening the land, tribe after tribe issued forth and hastening northward, spreading great masses to the east and to the west. Again, the tribes of the Arabians or the Saracens are likened to locusts. From another historian, Edward Upham, in the book called History of the Ottoman Empire, written in 1829, he says, The Persian Empire attracted the arms of these locusts, as the swarms of hungry Saracens were not unaptly called. And from another historian, Henry Hart Millman, in his work History of Latin Christianity, Volume 4, written 1881, he says, in a passage in a later letter to Count Bosso, the Pope describes the Saracens as an army of locusts, turning the whole land into a wilderness. Extensive regions were so desolate as to be inhabited only by wild beasts. Even the Pope applies the symbol of locusts to the Saracens. So in these next few slides, let's take a geographical snapshot at the movements of this mighty army of locusts, the Saracens, as they came forth upon the earth. The beginnings of the Islamic Empire were between 622 and 632 AD. At this time, the Saracens were to be found in the Arabian Peninsula, as shown here. And once again, please note that all the boundaries shown in these maps are approximate only and are for illustration purposes. From there, between 632 and 661 AD, the Saracens quickly spread into Persia and Egypt and parts of North Africa, as shown here. In the Hore Apocalyptica, Eliot says of the Caliph Omar, or perhaps pronounced Umar, that in 10 years, from 634 to 644 AD, the Saracens had reduced to his obedience 36,000 cities or castles, destroyed 4,000 churches, and built 1,400 mosques for the exercise of the religion of Muhammad. So we can clearly see the rapidity of their spread and the wake of destruction that they left behind. The church buildings, of course, would be those of the professing church at that time, and these buildings are ruined and mosques went up everywhere. Edward Gibbon said, Muhammad, with the sword in one hand and the Quran in the other, erected his throne on the ruins of Christianity and of Rome. Between 661 and 750 AD, the Saracen Empire continued to spread further eastward, northward and westward as shown here. The Saracens had intended that their forces should not only overwhelm the eastern part of the then known world, but also that they should totally overrun and subjugate Europe and meet together in the north. And you can see from this map that this was quite a possibility. However, they were not permitted to do so. Once again, God had appointed their bounds thus far and no further. And so it was that they were stopped dead in their tracks by Charles Martel, otherwise known as the Hammer, at the Battle of Tours in 732 AD. According to the prophecy in Revelation 9 verse 5, they were permitted not to kill, but that they should torment men five months. In other words, they were not allowed to totally wipe out, but rather to inflict a lot of pain for a determined period of time. And I'm going to talk more about this period of five months soon. And so we can see from this slide the high water mark in the expansion of the Saracen Empire. And it's quite obvious that had it not been for God's plan and purpose, they would have totally overrun Europe. It's also very interesting that the very areas overtaken by the Saracens are the same areas normally affected by the natural locus. Five months is also the natural period each year when these literal locusts are active. Now we go to the appearance of these locusts. In verse 7 we are told that their faces were as the faces of men. 
which can be a reminder that what is being being brought before us here is a human army. However, Edward Gibbon, when speaking of the Saracens, says that their beards were that venerable sign of manhood. So to the Arab in those days, the beard was a sign of their manhood. In fact, if you didn't have a beard, you were thought of as strange. Thus, the Saracens had faces of men, which back then was only characteristic of the Persians and the Arabs. In contrast to this, there are the Goths, concerning which Eliot says in the Horae Apocalyptica, the Goths and other kindred barbarian tribes are set aside, the faces of these being very singularly noticed by a contemporary of their earliest incursions, I mean Jerome, as having faces shaven and smooth. Now, not only did these locusts have the faces of men, but verse 7 also says, and they had the hair as the hair of women. How unexpected and strange. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 14, Doth not even nature itself teach you that, if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? However, these bearded Saracens also had long hair as the hair of women. The Saracens were both bearded, bearded and also long-haired, as can be seen in this sculpture of the Saracen made by an English company called Bossons. Pliny the Elder, who was the contemporary of John, at the close of the first century speaks of the turban Arabs with their uncut hair in his work called Natural History. Ammianus Marcellinus in the 4th and Jerome in the 5th century also speak of the long-haired Arabs. In the Horae Apocalyptica, Eliot gives us the details of an old Arabian tale found in poem, poems by Antar, who was an Arabian knight and poet who lived at the time we are dealing with here. In these tales, it says, he adjusted himself properly, twirling his whiskers, folded up his hair under his turban, drawing it from off his shoulders. His hair flowed down his shoulders. We will hang him by his hair. And again, this verifies the fact that these Saracens were known for their beards and long hair. And also noteworthy is that the prophecy says that on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold. And looking at this image of a Saracen warrior, it becomes immediately clear that they wore golden or crown-like turbans upon their heads under which they kept their long hair. From Eliot's Horae Apocalyptica, we learn that in the preface to the contemporary Arabian poem of Antar, it is said, quote, It was a usual saying among them that God had bestowed four peculiar things on the Arabs, that their turbans should be to them instead of diadems, their tents instead of walls and houses, their swords instead of entrenchments, and their poems instead of written laws. End quote. In Ezekiel 23 verse 42, we read of the Sabaeans from the wilderness which put bracelets upon their hands and beautiful crowns upon their heads. These Sabaeans were a people from the south of Arabia who are thought to be from Abraham through Keturah, and who intermingle with the Ishmaelites. These people are noted for beautiful crowns upon their heads. In like manner, the subject of the prophecy in Revelation chapter 9, these Saracens, a people from the same area and possibly related to the Sabaeans, are also noted for crowns like crowns of gold upon their heads. Verse 8 tells us, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. Not only is this mention of a lion another pointer to the east, as the Arabian wilderness was the horn of the lion, but in relation to this first woe trumpet, it is telling us of the fierceness and the ferocity with which the Saracen locusts came and covered the land under the Mohammedan banner. These Saracens are often noted by historians as lion-like. Edward Gibbon says, Eutychus, the patriarch, observes that the Saracens fought with the courage of lions. 
And again, I want to remind you that the fact that an historian refers to the Saracens as lions does not in itself make the interpretation correct. The fact is that many other people and armies have, of course, been described as lion-hearted and fighting like lions. Nonetheless, it clearly demonstrates that the symbolism of the prophecy is appropriate and when the prophecy is taken together with everything else, not just one or two things here and there, but everything else, it is clear what people are being referred to and here it is the Saracens. And again we read from Antar, the Arabian poem, which describes these Arabian armies with the imagery of both locusts and lions. It says, But I must assail you without further preparation, and I shall command these armies, numerous as the locusts, to assault you, and to grind you like grain, and to ride you like lions. And throughout Antar, again and again, the lion is used as a constant emblem of the Saracen, of the Saracen warriors. Now, what made these Saracen hordes so lion-like, so fierce and savage? The writings of Edward Gibbon give us some real insight into what made these Mohammedans so fierce and lion-like. Edward Gibbon said, The intrepid souls of the Arabs were fired with enthusiasm. The death which they, have always, which they had always despised became an object of hope and desire. The Quran inculcates, in the most absolute sense, the tenets of faith and predestination, which would extinguish both industry and virtue if the actions of man were governed by his speculative belief. So here it's explained that it is the Quran, the smoke that came up from the bottomless pit, that is the reason why these people became so fierce, and because of these teachings, as Gibbon says, the death which they had always despised became an object of hope and desire. Let's continue to read from Edward Gibbon. Yet their influence in every age has exalted the courage of the Saracens and Turks. The first companions of Muhammad advanced to the battle with a fearless confidence. There is no danger where there is no chance. They were ordained to perish in their beds or they were safe and invulnerable amidst the darts of the enemy. The sword, says Muhammad, is the key of heaven and of hell. A drop of blood shed in the cause of God, a night spent in arms, is of more avail than two months of fasting or prayer. Whosoever falls in battle, his sins are forgiven. At the day of judgment, his wound shall be resplendent as vermilion, and odoriferous as musk, and the loss of his limbs shall be supplied by the wings of angels and cherubim. So we can start to get a real idea of what the Quran inculcated into the followers of Muhammad that made them desire to go to war and to die. Coupled with all of this was the promise that all of their carnal, sensual and sexual desires would be increased a hundredfold if they died in the fight for the Muhammadan cause. And Edward Gibbon writes, 72 Hauris, or black-eyed girls, of resplendent beauty, blooming youth, virgin purity, and exquisite sensibility will be created for the use of the meanest believer. A moment of pleasure will be prolonged to a thousand years, and his faculties will be increased a hundredfold to render him worthy of his felicity. In the book View of the State of Europe during the Middle Ages by Henry Hallam, we read this. But the Crusades were a temporary effort, not thoroughly congenial to the spirit of Christendom, which, even in the darkest and most superstitious ages, was not susceptible of the solitary and overruling fanaticism of the Muslim. They needed no excitement from pontiffs and preachers to achieve the work to which they were called. The precept? was in their law, the principle was in their hearts, the assurance of success was in their swords. Quote, o Prophet, end quote, exclaimed Ali when Muhammad, in the first years of his mission, sought among the scanty and hesitating assembly of his friends a vizier and lieutenant in command. Quote, I am the man. Whoever rises against thee, I will dash out his teeth, tear out his eyes, 
break his legs, rip up his belly, O Prophet, I will be thy vizier over them. End quote. These words of Muhammad's early and illustrious disciple are, as it were, a text upon which the commentary expands into the whole Saracenic history. They contain the vital essence of his religion, implicit faith, and ferocious energy. And also, it is of interest that Muhammad named this man Ali the Lion of Allah. Henry Hallam continues, Death, slavery, tribute to unbelievers were the glad tidings of the Arabian prophet. To the idolaters, indeed, or those who acknowledged no special revelation, one alternative only was proposed, conversion or the sword. So we can clearly see from what we have just been reading that it was the Quran, the teachings of Muhammad, the smoke from the pit that made the Saracens so incredibly fierce and lion-like. They didn't need a pep talk to stir them up for battle. Their whole teaching made them desire to die in battle for the Muhammadan cause. And of course, this very same teaching animates the followers of Islam to this very day. Islam is not a peaceful religion, despite how many times we're told that it is. The only peace you can have with Islam is to submit to it. And with that, I'll bring to an end the fifth trumpet, part three, and we'll move on to part four.